And I want to welcome you on behalf of the USF community here this evening. In particular, I want to welcome you on behalf of our Dean, Michael Weber, who's been enormously supportive in launching this lecture series. And I want to welcome you on behalf of John Copeland, Father John Copeland, who is the chairperson of the Jesuit Foundation Board, along with Catherine Horiuchi, our associate dean for the School of Management, who serves on the Jesuit Foundation Board, which supported this lecture series with a grant in addition to the School of Management. Uh, as I indicated when we were getting ready to get started, I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction of Dr. Ross. You can read about it. Uh, you can look it up. And, uh, but what I would like to say is uh, we're enormously honored to have Dr. Ross be our capstone speaker for the uh, Change the World from Here lecture series. Uh, when the University of San Francisco announced that as, as its theme, as its operating system, as its, as its set of values uh, last year, I could think of no one better than Dr. Ross to conclude the series with the work that he's doing up and down California in building healthy communities for the California Dow. So we're very fortunate this evening to have a number of, of just outstanding people join us from the University of San Francisco. And I want to welcome our colleagues, the Dean uh, from the School of Nursing and uh, Health Professions, Dean Judy Karshmer, and faculty there, Anna Trevathan, who are joining us here tonight as well. Uh, I want to welcome Mary Riddell from the Vice Provost, from the Office of the Provost, Vice Provost joining us, and the Director of the Lane Center for Catholic Social Thought, Mike Duffy, who's here. And in particular, I want to welcome and express our enormous gratitude for his joining us here this evening but even more so for joining USF as distinguished visiting professor, uh, Dr. Clarence Jones, who's here tonight, uh, who's had a distinguished career and continues to build on a career that uh, served Dr. Martin Luther King as his speechwriter and legal advisor. And in many ways, I feel that the, uh, the, the to, to conclude my introduction, uh, the, the mission of a Jesuit university uh, the idea that Father uh, Walter Burkhardt, a Jesuit theologian, when he talks about justice, he uses the biblical definition of fidelity to the demands of relationship, being faithful to those we're in relationship with. And in having Dr. Jones here this evening, we really have someone who's been at the epicenter of what it means for America to be faithful to those who we are in relationship with. And now Dr. Ross here this evening to continue that and to say what does justice mean in social change in California and in our country, and how at the California Endowment is his, under his leadership as president and CEO, and with his vice presidents and with his board of trustees, how he is keeping that commitment, that, that fidelity to the demands of relationship, the fidelity of faithfulness to those who are in communities that are not well served. And how are we as a society being faithful to that? So with that, I'd like to introduce and really thank publicly Dr. Ross for joining us. He'll speak for about 45 minutes. We'll do some question and answer after that for about 10 minutes. And uh, really can't thank you enough on behalf of Father Prevett and our provost, uh, Jennifer Turpin, and our dean, uh, Mike Weber, myself. It's just tremendous to have you here, Dr. Ross. Thank you for joining us. Okay for Philly guys. <laughs> um, it's okay. Let's do this. So, first of all, thank thank you for being here. I don't know how many of you were ordered to be here. <laughs> Zero. I voted for the fifth. But uh, e evenings are very valuable to me particularly evenings with, with my family. So uh, anyone who ventures out after 6 o'clock in the evening uh, to listen to some, some so-called expert uh, run on for 45 minutes is, it gets my vote for a hero of the week. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Rich, for having me and thinking of me. Um, and uh, just finished a very nice dinner with um, some leading uh, faculty and, and figures here from the university. And uh, it was not what I expected uh, in terms of dinner conversation. 
it, it's been some time since I've spent uh, at the upper echelon of the university, um, but um, it's a pretty feisty bunch, you know. <laughs> I think if we, if we, if we, if we had one more glass of wine, we would have started throwing a food <laughs> <laughs> um, So I'm, I'm uh, I was letting folks know at dinner, I was somewhat daunted by uh, coming up with some remarks that could match this expression. Uh, change the world from here. I love uh, the expression. Um, but it, it, it evokes and begs the question, um, what change, whose world, and where is here? And so for, for the purposes of, of this conversation, given that I, uh, I'm going to stay within, my, within my, uh, my zone, my comfort zone, which is uh, I've spent most of my career advocating for better lives of vulnerable children and young people. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of how that happened. Um, I think it's relevant to some of the, the insights. Um, but I really love the idea that um, the culture of this institution is imbued with this notion, this very idea. And I think um, each of you, I'll give you the punchline uh, now, in case you need to leave early or fall asleep. <laughs> uh, which is, as, you, as, as your head rises off the pillow and you uh, get yourself organized to come to this institution every day, say that to yourself. Uh, how is it that my action today contributes in some way, shape, or form, no matter how small, to changing the world from here? I think it's a very um, high and important bar, and, and for reasons which um, I think most of you agree, you probably would be in this room in the first place. Our nation needs that kind of leadership. And, and leadership, uh, my favorite three word definition of leadership, which I heard from a grassroots uh, community organizer, uh, is hope in action. Hope in action. Leadership is hope. Uh, which invokes two very important words, hope, uh, and also acting upon the hope. But also allows, um, through that definition, anybody can be a leader. And hopefully you'll, you'll be convinced that we certainly believe in that in California down in terms of the work that we do. Um, my, um, <clears throat> let me take you back to, to 19, uh, to, to, to mid to late 1980s, uh, I, I, uh, I finished my undergraduate training in Philadelphia, undergraduate uh, degree there, uh, went to medical school in Philly, uh, trained at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia as a pediatrician, and then my first real job was working in a community health center, um, and this is a, uh, I think Rich is the only white person I know from Camden. Uh, and across the river from Philadelphia, there's a, there's a, a, a now distressed, um, struggling uh, city that struggled for quite some time, has its ups and downs, called Camden, New Jersey. Um, and I, and I love I, I love that job. It was uh, uh, the federal government had given me a scholarship uh, for medical school, and then I, I paid the scholarship back by uh, serving a low income health profession shortage area community, and, and Camden was, was the place. So, so I began practicing my craft at a community health center in South Camden. Um, and uh, I arrived there full of passion and full of energy. This was the job of my life. I wanted to stay there for, until I retired. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to help uh, contribute to healing uh, in a community like, uh, like Camden, a place like Camden. And between 19, I'm sure about a year after I got there, between 1984 and 1986, uh, my world was turned upside down professionally. Um, 
and we began to experience in Camden uh, extraordinary rates of uh, infant mortality, of uh, premature births, of youth homicides and violence, um, sexually transmitted disease, HIV AIDS was spreading like crazy. Um, domestic violence increased significantly. Child abuse and neglect increased significantly. Um, and it was, a, it was a period of time that was not unique to Camden, it was happening in most urban centers around the country. And the catalytic um, agent for that was? Crack. 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 Okay. And uh, the, reason, the reason for the change was before, prior to 1984, poor people could not buy cocaine. It just wasn't available to them. It's sort of like having enough money to buy a Volkswagen and walking into a Rolls Royce dealership and saying, I want to buy a Rolls Royce, but you only have Volkswagen money. Right? You just, the, the way cocaine was sold was in, in uh, price points of $100 and up. Right? But when some evil genius uh, created crack, the affordability price point for crack cocaine went from $100 to $5. Um, now, understanding that the, the pharmacology of, of cocaine is, is relevant to the story and to the impact on public health because uh, cocaine, unlike heroin, is a very short-acting drug. It's metabolized very quickly. And unlike heroin, which kind of hangs around the liver for a while and sort of bleeds into the bloodstream, you can get a 6, 8, 10, 12-hour high from heroin, uh, with cocaine, particularly crack cocaine, was very short acting. So the intensity of the euphoric sensation from crack cocaine is 20 or 30 minutes. Enormous sense of well-being packaged into that short period of time. And so basically what happened was you introduce a passport out of hopelessness and misery for five months. It's a pretty good deal. If you're, if you're hopeless and poor, you don't have a sense of a future. Um, that's not a bad deal. And so, um, departing from the pharmacology aspect of crack, now let's get to economics for a second. Um, pretty soon, if you, particularly if you live in a low-income neighborhood, or even if you're not, um, you run out of $5 bills. And so if you're a male and you're addicted to crack, um, you steal to support your habit. Right? Um, and you steal from anywhere. Right? You steal from your grandmother, you steal from your neighbor, you steal from the people down the street, you break into houses, you break into cars. And it's my theory that this, this little device that all of us have in our cars, a little boop, 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 this thing. This is a crack cocaine phenomenon. Because in the 1980s, everybody was getting a car broken into. If you lived in Detroit, New York, LA, Philadelphia, it didn't matter. But, um, those of you that are old enough to, to remember that period of time may remember that. Uh, certainly, I saw it, I certainly saw it in New York, in Philadelphia, in Canada. Um, it happened so often that some people put a sign in their car that said, no radio. <laughs> Remember that? It was also the advent of the removable yes. tape deck. A track, <laughs> later cassette deck, right? Where you could take, because everyone was getting a car from it. Uh, if you're, on the other hand, a woman and addicted to crack, how do you support that habit? You sell yourself. And so, uh, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV AIDS all went through the roof in the 1980s. Um, youth homicides went through the roof because if you were young and smart enough to stay away from the addiction of the drug, you certainly could see its entrepreneurial benefits and make fast money. 
and uh, being a very uh, this this is a this is a trade industry not regulated by the SEC. Um, and so, in, the, in order for you to protect your turf, you had to resort to very violent means and weaponry. And you see um, a couple of films who illustrate this pretty well. One of them was New Jack City. Uh, another one was uh, Boys in the Hood. Uh, we begin to see at least the Hollywood version. I think it's actually pretty close to reality of, of what the impact of, 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 a, of a crack epidemic on, on drug gangs. And so you have to, you have to put yourself in a position of this hotshot young black physician, Ivy League educated, trained at one of the best children's hospitals in the world, who arrives in this community to engage in the practice of community healing. And I'm being, I, I'm dealing with something that I have no clue how to deal with. It actually, it actually made me quite bitter about my educational training, or my residency training. Why is it that I spent, I, I could manage asthma, I could manage meningitis, I could manage iron deficiency anemia, I could manage any, any number of, of disease conditions that show up in the emergency room or the doctor's office. But um, what prescription do you write for hopelessness? What's in the black bag? to fix that. And so what I was being introduced to was what I would later learn and find out, and I said, some of you know, some of the public health, public health policy people here, I was coming to understand, I had a rude introduction to the social determinants of health. The roles that education and housing and neighborhoods and, and poverty play in someone's health status. And uh, it was a it was a period of time for me where I, mean, I remember I remember the particular day uh, where I saw that the equivalent of a burning bush for me, which for which I said, okay, I gotta think about a different career path here. Uh, there was there was a, a family of uh, children that came to see me. Uh, they were one of my favorite families at the clinic. Um, pediatricians are not different than, than college professors. We have our favorites. <laughs> um, and this was a family with three young kids, all in the age of five. And I saw their chart in the door. Um, I realized when I picked up their charts that I hadn't seen them in a while. And uh, uh, looked at their charts and, and, and they were behind on everything. They were behind on shots, they were behind on anemia screenings and all the blood poisoning tests and a whole bunch of other things. And so I went in prepared to read uh, Mom the Riot Act uh, and went in and Mom's not there, Dad is there, whom I never met. Um, so African American family, African American father, uh, construction worker, big beefy guy. Um, and I'm reading in the Riot Act, hey, you know, Kids have been shots, you've been here in six months, or, you know, what the hell's going on? And so uh, he sheepishly uh, whispered if we could have a word outside in the hallway. And so you know what's coming, right? Um, so he takes me outside, and I said, man, the kids are behind the shots, you know, what's going on here, and where's Velma? He said, hey, you know, Doc, I hate to say this, man, but, you know, Velma got hooked on that crack thing. And so, you know, it got so bad that I had to take on a second job because she's stealing from everything in the house. And it got so bad. This was, it was the week before Christmas in 1986. I remember it because the story you told me that she had, a Velma, had gone into the closet and taken the Christmas presents that he bought for the kids to sell them. And so, you know how certain moments kind of hit you, <laughs> and they kind of jolt you out of, you know, out of the reality area. And so I was, I was, uh, you know, so one of my favorite families, uh, and, and, and you know, crack cocaine made Velma forget that she was a mother. 
Um, and I went to a lot of deliveries of, of, of babies, of crap babies. Okay, babies who were born at one pound, a pound and a half, two pounds, born at 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation, instead of four week, 40 weeks gestation, because the impact the crack had on a mother, on a pregnant mother, number one, she would stop on her prenatal care appointments. Number two, cocaine is a muscular stimulant. Okay, and the largest muscular tissue or organ in a woman's body is the uterus. So the use of cocaine and crack cocaine would, would stimulate pharmacologically the muscle tissue of the uterus and spit these babies out at much earlier than, than, than they should. And so um, I'm trying to paint a picture for you of, of, of both uh, frustration and bitterness uh, but also a wake-up call for me about how I wanted to spend my career. When I, and I decided that night, um, after, by the way, uh, one of the, the, the two-year-old child in the family, um, dad told me was tugging at, at um, his ear all night. And so those of you that are parents know, you know, when a kid tugs at their ear, generally they have a what? Yeah. Air infection. <laughs> Not with this kid. He had a roach in his ear. <laughs> and as a whole, I, I, I could, I could, it's after dinner, so maybe I won't go into detail. But, but there's a, there is a way, those of, those of us who worked in inner city, we worked in an in emergency room in Detroit, LA, Philly, South LA, uh, San Francisco, you run into somebody who's taking a roach out of a kid's ear, it happens. Okay. And there's a way to do it. Okay. Um, but the combination of pulling the roach out of a kid's ear, <clears throat> whose mother had become addicted to crack cocaine, who was a wonderful mother and a great family, somehow it just broke me down that night. And I said to myself, I gotta get up street. I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I wanna shift my career to, you know, the, 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 the anatomy here is, is the, the, the metaphor of the, you know, the bodies are, are, are floating down the raging river and people are, are trying to, on the shore, trying to pull the, the bodies out. And somebody says, I'm going to go upstream and find out what the hell's going on upstream. Who, who's, who's throwing these kids in the river? Or what bridge are they falling from? What, what is going on up there? And that's what I wanted to do with my kids. And so that led so a long winded way of saying, um, and, I, and I love being a pediatrician. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not that I, I hated the work. I still love the work. But I was, I, I, that night I became committed to getting upstream and being committed to how do we create healthier environments for children? And how do we maximize our opportunity to reach their dreams and reach their potential? And you know, we now know what the social determinants of, of health are. We now know that um, the public health research tells us this. 80% of what influences our health status and our life expectancy has nothing to do with doctors, hospitals, clinics, or health insurance. That if you want me to predict with some degree of statistical certainty your life expectancy, tell me your address in the United States of America. That the most influential predictor of our health status is not our genetic code, our zip code. And if you live in a neighborhood as a child that has way more McDonald's than farmer's markets, that has Crips and Bloods rather than the Boy Scouts, that has um, vacant graffiti strewn rocks instead of skate parks or green parks, or if you live next to a crack house rather than a YMCA or um, an after school program, it is, uh, all of those things have extraordinary influences on you. Or if you go to a school that has a 90% uh, college graduation or college matriculation rate rather than a 60% school dropout rate, that's going to have a big influence. So I became obsessed with this idea of a place 
and neighborhood and the social determinants of health. So let me share with you um, uh, a, a, a few insights. I, I'm not sure that any of them will, will surprise or be uh, ahas or epiphanies for anyone here. Um, the um, To put this issue in a, in a, in a, in a, in a national context, um, it's very difficult to separate the impact of poverty and impoverished and hopeless neighborhoods and communities on the health and wellness and well-being of a young person w without understanding um, the culture that comes from the top, right? And so the culture that comes from the top in this country too often has been in even in the year 2000 and beyond, the application of Elizabethan poor laws to how we view the poor and the marginalized, and you know, pick, pick one, doesn't matter, uh, marginalized and or poor, vulnerable, LGBT youth, black male in a neighborhood, foster kid, uh, undocumented, young person, uh, um, this country <clears throat> criminalizes poverty. And so just, just think about an entirely new and different narrative, um, and I'll tell you how we tried to deploy that narrative to California Endowment, but, but the narrative shift needed to be from poor people in vulnerable communities or vulnerable people in poor communities as um, problems to be solved and to be fixed versus architects of a compelling and persuasive hope-filled future. Right. And so you, you, you have to decide which you can't, you can't straddle that fence. You have to decide from where you are whether you believe that children in those families and in those neighborhoods are problems to be fixed versus uh, an extraordinary set of assets of human capital for our nation. Once you decide the latter, it takes you down that direction. Once you decide the former, it takes you down this direction. And that is the, that is the battle for the soul of this nation around poverty right now. Okay. Um, so that's uh, one point. Second point is uh, how, how we get from, because even if you care about this, we seem to have uh, more whining and moaning and bitching about it than we have strategic, disciplined, sustained action. So again, changing from here means what, what is the role, in my case, of the California Endowment? What is the role, in your case, of the University of San Francisco in acting? Uh, with some sense of sustained activity on, on the problem of the issue. Uh, and here are the challenges that get in the way, even for people of goodwill. In the field of, I'm going to talk about the field of philanthropy, and I'll talk about on the university uh, setting. In the field of philanthropy, uh, we tend to worship at the altar of innovation. We love the shiny new idea. And we have deluded ourselves in the field of philanthropy that if you just fund the shiny new idea and you fund the evaluation that that shiny new idea actually works, that somehow it will be scaled into replicable change. It is a myth. It is a fallacy. It's not that it never happens, but it happens so infrequently 
that when it does happen, it's actually cause for, for significant celebration. But as a general rule, it doesn't happen. Because if you fund even a neighborhood-based community intervention, and you could pick the issue, you could pick foster to help the foster kids, you could pick gang work, you could pick, listen, I, I, you guys know about Father Greg and Home Industries. <laughs> you know, Father Greg has broken the code on how to give gang members and gang members help, a hope. You know, his, 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 uh, his moniker is nothing stops, a, nothing stops a bullet like a job. And Father Greg has been working in LA with those young men, and now young women as well. Cutting edge program, social entrepreneurship, they have six businesses that help support the programs from bakeries and, 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 and t-shirt businesses and, and uh, catering businesses. They just got um, a, a concession stand at, at, at a LAX airport. Um, and his success rate is pretty damn good. He's been doing it for 15 years, at least. We've been funding him for at least ever since I got there. Question, why doesn't our juvenile probation department run anything like Homeboy Industries? Massive amounts of taxpayer money going into the juvenile probation department, which is really just a platform for jail. And so when people say to me, we don't have enough innovation, and we don't have enough ideas, and, and you know, philanthropy needs to be about the, the power of the idea and the power of the innovation, I'm not so quick to jump on that bandwagon. Don't get me wrong, I love new ideas. But our problem is not funding new ideas. Our problem is we don't know what to do with one when one works. We fail at scale and success. The Harlem Children's Zone has been on, and Jeff Cannon, Jeff is a friend of mine. I love Jeff dearly. He's been on Oprah, he's been on the cover of Time Magazine, he's been to the White House, and the White House and this Congress can't figure out how to spend the money to scale up the Harlem Children's Zone. Jeff runs their program on $50 million a year, and the federal replication dollars budget for the Harlem Children's Zone is $100 million. So that's our problem in philanthropy, is that we worship at the, at, the, at the altar of innovation. While our well-intended colleague, colleagues in the university community, too many of them, perhaps the present company, they said, worships at the altar of data. We just think the new idea that's been proven to work will scale social change. Too many of our university colleagues think that, well, if you just, if you just just publish the right paper and the data and get the right report out in the right journal. We're going to get the report out to, to, to the lawmakers and they'll do something different. And it doesn't happen. Who's supposed to do the it of that work? Little elves? <laughs> who, who, whom are we relying upon? And so in, in the corporate sector, innovation scales through profit really fast, right? Somebody whip out an iPhone. Here you go, get your got that iPhone. Sure, Just yeah. hold that up. Yeah. Exhibit A. <laughs> Exhibit A. Okay, iPhone was an idea one day, and, and like in six months, bang! Huge scale, but through profit, right? And innovation. In the social sector, of issues around the business of social change and social justice, there's only one thing that scales, and that's power. And in philanthropy, we can delude ourselves all we want. In university settings, we can delude ourselves all we want. But until you are trying to figure out a way to connect the ideas and the data so they serve as a tool, not the ends, but the means to asserting power. Clarence Jones is sitting here, may I walk, walk with um, Dr. Martin Luther King, and, and you know, I, I, let me tell you something, Clarence, I, I shudder to think if Dr. Martin Luther King walked into even my foundation with a proposal 50 years ago, 
and we start asking him about his theory of change and his logic model and what data does he have, and you know, I shudder, shudder to think how we would receive a proposal from Dr. Martin Luther King or Cesar Chavez. You want to do what? Come on, man. And so let me let me do this before uh, before I close. I want to I want to give you a, a real life example. It's not a big major issue, um, but Rich asked me to, to to share some insights about learning. So let me let me tell you about what we're trying to do with California Endowment. So California Endowment is a private health foundation, state of California, with about three billion dollars in assets. We probably do about 150 million dollars a year in grants. Okay, it sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. The $150 million we spend a year in grants at the California Endowment, which seems like a huge amount of money, is 0.4% of the state's Medi-Cal budget. It is budget dust compared to the major avenues of public resources. So, so when, when someone asked us to fund a program that is about charity. And charity is a wonderful thing. It's in the Bible. It's got to be a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. But social justice is about change. Ch charity has its place. It is a wonderful thing. But if you invest in charity at the expense of investing in change, you are complicit with the oppression that that system breeds. So what we try to do is to say, OK, let's take a 10-year cut. Let's pick 14. We can talk about how we got to number 14. It could have been 5, it could have been 20. We picked 14 communities in the state of California. Our experience told us that meaningful change takes time. There is no two-year grant that is going to turn a neighborhood around. It's just not going to happen. Jeff Cannon has been at the Harlem Children's Home for 18 years. We asked the board for a 10-year commitment to these 14 communities, and the communities are places like Boyle Heights, South Central Los Angeles, uh, Iron Triangle in Richmond, East Oakland, uh, Coachella, Salinas, uh, not Beverly Hills, not Brentwood, not Pacific Palisades. <laughs> Can we improve health and well-being and the environments of health and well-being for young people in those neighborhoods? We call that building healthy communities. Now, um, you can't get at that amount of money and this is a billion dollar commitment for us over 10 years. And so two thirds to three quarters of every dollar we spend is going into this campaign. Um, so, so we did have to have a strategic plan and we did have to do some logic behind it. We did have to come up with a theory of change. Um, and those things are important. You just can't be, you, you can date your theory of change, but you don't have to be married to it. Okay. And I'll give you an example. In one of the things we agreed upon, our uh, board of directors and, 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 and me as CEO, was we wanted uh, community residents and neighborhood leaders and young people meaningfully involved. So what we did was we, we, we picked four areas uh, that we knew were relevant to communities, uh, but we also wanted to be able to, to decide, okay, what, what kind of differences do we want to see in these young people's lives at the end of 10 years? So we picked child obesity, which was not a new issue for us, children's health coverage, which is not a new issue for us, youth violence, mm -hmm. not a new issue for us, and school health. And the school health metric actually became attendance. So we engaged these communities about um, uh, those, those items and those issues. Uh, the board wanted to visit every one of the 14 communities uh, over the course of board meetings. Um, and so in, uh, I want to say it was October of, what is this, 2013? Uh, October of 2011, I took my board to Fresno. Uh, we have a, a building up a community site in Central West Fresno. And we had a presentation from the youth group uh, that we were supporting there. And uh, we invited them to tell us what their view of a healthy community was and what the key challenges or issues were that they wanted us to uh, support them in the work. They didn't talk about child obesity, they didn't talk about children's health coverage. They said, we want you to help us get rid of zero tolerance in our schools. I was like, what? 
Isn't zero tolerance a good thing? Does it, does it help keep our schools safer? You know, what, are you, what are you talking about? And so they, they, they embarked on lecturing us about the following. That there was an epidemic of school suspensions, particularly impacting kids of color in middle schools and high schools, and in particular, impacting black and brown young men. And that they were getting suspended hand over fist, and it was unhealthy for the young people and unhealthy for the community that this was happening. And so the board is looking at me like, <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't in the strategic plan, Bob, you know, where, where did this come from? And by the way, what are you doing about it? <laughs> and so to make a long story short, we began to hear the same from Richmond, Long Beach and South Central Los Angeles and Boyle Heights and City Heights in San Diego and Coachella and Merced and Salinas. We began to hear the same story. And so we did the reverse. We started looking at the data. And the data now is beginning to come from California and Texas and Maryland and Massachusetts and Alabama and Tennessee and North Carolina, there's an epidemic of school suspensions going on in this country. And the Department of Justice study follows, which said, guess what? It's disproportionately impacting black and brown young men. Kids were right. Kids went on to uh, conclude their presentation was by saying, by the way, Dr. Ross, it is our belief that the portal to the incarceration superhighway begins here with this issue. That this is where our young men are marginalized, stigmatized, and criminalized. And so that was a hell of a wake up call. <laughs> but it also had me thinking, and those of you that are, that are certainly around either my age or near my age, I don't know how this this is a the, the zero tolerance thing is, is sort of a post Columbine phenomenon. Okay, the, the combination of the war on drugs and the Columbine shootings led to this zero tolerance policy. And I remember hearing at the time it's not zero tolerance for the child, it's zero tolerance for the behavior. That's bullshit. <laughs> this is zero tolerance for the child. Okay, the way this played out. I'll tell you that right now. And the data is supporting it hand over fist. And so we began to invest a little bit to get the data cleaned up uh, and to present to, to uh, uh, for, for the young, but, but the youth groups and youth advocacy organizations in Richmond, in Fresno, in, in South LA, in Boyle Heights demanded to come together. And they did. Using technology, we had a couple of virtual uh, statewide rallies. Um, you know how young people are nowadays, Facebook, Twitter, and all that. That went wild on this issue. They began showing up at um, school board hearings and um, the state legislature. They demanded that a select committee from the legislature be created on what's happening to young black and brown men and one was. And in the course of 18 months, these young people succeeded, and the organization that supported them, in getting nine bills to the governor's desk to reverse school discipline issues and the suspension of having done. And, and I remember, I remember sitting at a meeting with the state superintendent of schools, Tom Torlson, who's a great guy. And I remember sitting here for the first time, and, and, and I said to him, I said, you know, Tom, I'm hearing from these young people about this school push-out thing. And, 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 he, and I said, you know, what, you know, what's going on with that? He said, what are you talking about? He didn't know what I was talking about. He does now. <laughs> the governor signed five of the bills. He vetoed four of them. Um, there's more activity on the others, right? And... We also find, and this is, where, this is where the innovation thing comes in, 
because you don't want to, and let me just say, I did not want to be in a position, like it's not the way we work, of piling on to the schools and saying bad schools, bad teachers. I didn't want to be part of that narrative. They got enough problems, people beat up on them. Nor did I go in saying, with the Department of Justice data saying, y'all are racist. I'm not saying that there aren't racist teachers, but, but that's not going to be my opening line when I engage. It, it's going to be, here's what's happening to these young people. And then that, it, that, that requires you to find what's working, right? Because you want to point to something that's working. And so we began to find oases a school in East LA, a school right here in San Francisco, a school in school in East Oakland, um, probably five or six schools around the state where on no money, or very, very little money, sheer force of will and leadership by that principal who said, we're not suspending kids anymore unless they do something terrible. They're selling heroin out of a locker? Okay, we'll suspend them. <laughs> Talking back to a teacher? No, we're not suspending them. And so there are schools that have markedly reversed their school suspension rates and improve school safety, and improve its uh, uh, achievement test scores. It can be done. And so we're funding sort of a best practices kind of institute to share. Uh, and some of them are, are interesting. Here's where the innovation comes in. There's a school here in San Francisco. I forget the name of the school. Somebody here may know. Where they brought transcendental meditation to the kids in the school. They call it quiet time. What is it? That's school choice. Yeah. Students to try to help their you know, um, medical science. Right. Well, well, this particular school in San Francisco used quiet time and, and transcendental meditation training to, to reverse the number of fights, reverse the number of suspensions, and improve student achievement. Okay? And the teachers and the principals love the work. Okay? So that, that's an innovation problem. Now, how you how you bill and get revenue to support transcendental meditation and classic is a whole other conversation, but you know that that's that's sort of where the little where the little elves come in, right? Where does the power dynamic come in? So I just wanted to give you that as an example, an inspiring example for me. Because what did we learn? Number one, um, as a pediatrician with three degrees a big fancy $3 billion foundation and all the researchers and data in the world. Sometimes the community knows more than you do. <laughs> you got to be okay with that. Sometimes you're even more okay with that. Sometimes you need to embrace that. Number two, he gave the young people involved with this campaign a sense of winning. Winning in their own school district or their own school, but also winning as being part of something bigger than themselves. And my favorite picture is a photograph, I should have brought it tonight to show you, of black and brown young men standing on the steps of the Capitol at a podium talking about their, their, their legislation and taking on visits with the Speaker of the House and General Steinberg and the Governor's Office about the kind of action you wanted to see. Assets. Assets in the, in the battle. Strength. Completely changed the narrative when we see, you know, what, what, what most people think when they see a bunch of black or brown young men standing on the corner. Completely different narrative. And so we have become very comfortable with, at least the California down, about the role that power and voice and advocacy play. It's not that we think little of innovation, it's not that we think little of data, but they are, they are tools, they are not the end. The end game is advancing social justice and advancing social change. And I believe these young people have unlocked a key, at least for us, to begin dismantling the incarceration system. The data tells us if a student is suspended once, once, it reduces his chances of going to community college by 
and going to four-year college by 72%, and increasing the likelihood that they'll end up in the juvenile justice system by 300%. Um, let, let me end on, on, and I don't know, but just for comments and questions. <clears throat> we could be smarter about the social change, social justice battle. Right? We're getting better at using data in its right place to help make compelling persuasive arguments. Technology is a game changer tactically in terms of connecting young people to each other and their voices. But we have a system that is engulfing our young men in particular, who come from places of hopelessness, for which the choice to do drugs or join a gang seems utterly and completely rational to them because of a lack of options. And we actually know when these young men, and young people, I would say, are screaming to us for help very early stages. Finding these young men is not like trying to find Osama bin Laden. Okay? They're not in a cave in Afghanistan somewhere. They show up being suspended from school. They show up with chronic absence in school. The data shows that, that young people who miss more than 20 days of school a year are headed for serious trouble. And the schools know who those kids are. And probably the earliest tangible intervention point is third grade reading. 75 to 80 percent of young black boys in this country in urban public school districts are not reading at reading at less than third grade reading, reading at less than uh, grade level proficiency. 75 to 80 percent. That is not acceptable. Why do we why do we let that happen when we know that to be true? And so what ends up happening is by the time you get to middle school, the data tells you who's going to jail. Statistically. I mean, data is not destiny. Right? But statistically, reading at less than grade level, chronic absence, suspended. There are bitter black and brown boys and even girls that are getting suspended in kindergarten. Come on now. If that's not a scream for help from the child or a scream for help from the family, what other signal do you need to read? And so we need a system that responds affirmatively and an embrace to the other young people and their families early on. Because I want to disrupt the pipeline to foster care. I want to disrupt the pipeline to incarceration. Because we know what happens when they get that far. And so the last point I'll make is, is social justice, social change, but thinking strategically and in a disciplined, data-driven way because the data allows you to make the taxpayer argument. Because right? why we're spending $120,000, $120,000 a year to keep somebody in juvenile hall. And we know what needs to happen at the community neighborhood. So that's, that's what we've been about. And we've been about trying to fund the voice and advocacy and the power of these young people and neighborhood leaders they work with. So that's change we want to see in the world uh, we inhabit from the place we're at. And uh, thank you for being here. I promised Mary Wardell the first question <laughs> at dinner, and uh, uh, I recognize uh, both personally and she's with the Office of the Provost. Let us uh, see if Mary wants to launch us with the first question. Well, actually, I have statements before, but I'll Oh, questions. We welcome questions. If you have yeah. statements, email them. If you have questions, and as I explained at dinner, I have university training that helps me with this. It's my training at Tenry University with the Japanese judo team. So we welcome questions. So Mary, get us started with inquiry. So my, my thought was that, and it was, it was picking up from our earlier conversation, and that 
as a university and as individuals, we are trained um, and as just educated and concerned citizens, we're trained at getting data and maybe talking about what the issues were. But I would say that how does a university such as USF use our assets, our um, intellectual, um, educational, social capital, and how do we then as individuals really try to help move these balls forward um, that it's in a way that's catalytic, that is um, influential, um, and really starts to move change. And you mentioned the, the examples of the gentleman in Harlem Zone and um, Father Boyle. And every time you see it, you see an individual who takes extraordinary measures with a group of folks around him or her to make change. And how do you create a narrative among a group like this that's obviously interested that goes from talking about a system and other people and they to helping people start to ask the questions, what do I do where I sit? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, this, that's uh, what a nice softball question. <laughs> <laughs> Think about two things. So one that was helpful to me, because I had been at the foundation four or five years when I, I brought the building of the community's plan to the board. Um, and I, need, I needed to step away from the place I was in for a minute and say to myself, if a young person in South Central Los Angeles were to design a private foundation to support his or her needs, what would it do? What, what would it behave like? And so I became consumed with this, this idea of operating from from that perspective, um, and, and it, op it opens up, and I think we're gonna have probably not time tonight. There are six or seven things we're doing completely differently that we never did before as a foundation as a result of this engagement. And one of them, I'll just give you an example, I know there's some folks here from social entrepreneurship. Uh, a foundation is really, someone said this to me one day, and I, and I chuckled and said, oh, isn't that clever? And then I thought about it. A, a, a private foundation is really, how do you say it? An investment company that does that does a few grants on the side, and I, I kind of that kind of the same chuckle reaction. Oh, that's that clever. Huh? And then I thought about it. And I said, "Damn, that's us." <laughs> Why? Because we have three billion dollars in assets. We're only using 150 million of that three billion dollars every year to meet mission. The other 2.85 billion is in the stock market doing nothing to support our mission, and maybe working against it. Okay. So for the first time, we began thinking about using a, at least a portion of our investment portfolio for impact investing or mission investing, where we get you know, the double bottom line kind of, of what's the social return and what's the economic return. And so that was, that was something new that, that, that we did. Um, the, the second thing I, I, would, I would do is, um, and this is true, I think, both for philanthropy and in university settings. We are consumed with our brand and our reputation. We have capital in our brand and reputation. And we are scared to death to spend it. Just, just sort of from the bully pulpit, and we talked about this, Clarence, you mentioned it, in the dinner we just had. Uh, can shame people into action. Sometimes, sometimes you need to, or you can inspire others. And so uh, there was one. There was one. There was one person I spoke to. I'm on. I know it's a long winded answer. Uh, there was one person I spoke to when we think about doing this ten year and building up the community campaign, who had done uh, a, a, camp, a, a somewhat similar uh, effort with another national foundation, and he was giving me some advice. And he said, Bob, the one thing you need to remember, because foundations like to trip over themselves um, talking about community transformation and social transformation. But the, but the fundamental question is, are you willing to transform yourself first? Are you willing to transform yourself to engage in that work a different way? And I really stuck with it. And um, we overhauled the foundation. We have 60% new faces <coughs> as a result of this particular mission. Um, 
And so we have to kind of get over ourselves a bit. Um, and so now you'll see, um, um, so, so we're, we're weighing in on health care from documented residents. Cal you know, who, who you gonna, you know, California, let's go now. They left out of Obamacare, let's go, stand tall. And so we're using the bully pulpit um, to do that. We use the bully pulpit around LGBTL. Um, what area where we need to use the bully pulpit and we, we, maybe someone else will be instead of punching and it'd be great if they do. Another hit public health issue is sexual abuse of women. You go to a women's jail, 80% of those women have been sexually abused. You go to a women's drug treatment program, 80% of those women have been sexually abused. What's up with that? Still in the closet. The data tells me there are probably six women in this room right now who've been abused. <laughs> the data also tells us that when children are exposed to trauma at an early age, it impacts their health for the rest of their life. Time does not heal all wounds. Not true. So it's you know how do we use some of that? It doesn't always have to be money. It's can, how can you leverage your brand and reputation in institutional capital and apply it with voice to an issue. Not thoughtlessly, but, but, but smartly. So, you know, uh, uh, let me go to the young lady right here. In the, oh, okay. She had her hand up first. <laughs> so it, it's sort of a common a question when you were referring to the legislative bodies and trying to create these programs on scale and how do you get that through Congress and have, these, have the funds released in order to do these on a level of scale. Part of that, though, is how do you combat that prison lobby that is trying to retain their money to continue the institutionalization of these young people and young men and incarcerate them, starting at an early age? Voices and power. This is a power game. Uh, we are talking about this in the dinner beforehand. Uh, look what the Senate just did on the gun violence. Mm -hmm. Disgrace. Might as well just, you know, spit on these kids' graves. Oh well, these things happen. And so the, 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 there are other public health examples of sort of how this works, right? Drinking and driving, uh, child abuse, domestic violence, tobacco. Pick those four. In every one of those four, and the worst is tobacco. There was a mountain of data, and the scientific and public health and medical community screaming, you know, for something to happen. And in the case of drinking and driving, it wasn't until some mothers got together and stared their congressman in the eye and said, this is a picture of my 16-year-old son. I'm holding you accountable today and in your next election if you don't do something. It's the same way to happen to work domestic violence. It's the same way we, we finally got the upper hand on the tobacco industry, although they're not dead by any means. Um, the first public health article coming out that defined uh, scientific evidence linking tobacco use to cancer and, and, and bad things around, 1921. 40 years before the Surgeon General gets to say, you know what, I think smoking is dead for your health. <laughs> Another 30 years before we say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have this in like movie theaters and airplanes and restaurants. Yeah. And that's because, I mean, that, 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 that wasn't a data problem, that's a power problem. And so my, my two cents, I think if I, if I were the czar of private philanthropy, I know this is going to sound harsh. I don't mean it the way it's going to come out. Let me just say it, and then I'll apologize later. <laughs> um, not on the public side, because I get that government can't fund advocacy. I get that. Okay. But on the private side, I would take $1 out of every research, out of every three research dollars, and I put it in advocacy. I put it in organizing. Because that is a really, it's just, I, don't, I mean, talk about hand to mouth. My goodness. Uh, anyone here is a committee organizer? Or, 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 committee besides the president? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 
so I, I think we bear part of the problem because we're one of the few institutions who can invest in that kind of voice. And guess what? There's now data to show, uh, we commissioned a study, or I'm quoting data here. We commissioned a study at USC that shows the health and wellness and achievement benefits of young people that are exposed to community civic engagement organizing. And it blew me away. Okay. There is a triple bottom line when you invest in advocacy and organizing. One, the community benefits from the change you're seeking. Two, it allows young people and people that are involved in organizing to remain civically engaged to vote. Three, young people and community residents who are dealing with their own trauma, oppressive racism, discrimination, whatever, begin to heal. That's what, that's what this study does. So when I got to the California Endowment, maybe 20% of our grants were in advocacy and organizing. Now it's probably 78. Uh, two more questions. One for you and the young lady right there. Uh, okay, it's, thanks. It's getting uh, late, so if you've got to go, go. Uh, so, uh, actually, I'm a social entrepreneur and an uh, angel uh, investor, of course, a uh, prospective San Francisco, uh, University of San Francisco student. So, um, actually, I have two questions. So, one question. Like the uh, okay, I've got one question uh, about now we focus on the thing that. Um, Entrepreneurial education uh, focus on the social innovation and uh, human experience. Um, I would like to know from your perspective how can we um, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, angel investors can do the contributions and uh, what can we can help to build the, uh, a healthy community. Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, something simple um, is mentor a young man or young woman. Uh, in, 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 in social entrepreneurship. Make him or her your intern. From the educational perspective. Well, oh man, don't, you, don't get into the education system. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take, just to tell you how far we've gone on this. Um, this work has given us some strange bedfellows. Um, one is Lady Gaga, hmm? whose foundation we work with. who uses the language of bravery for young people who are marginalized and feeling alone. The second partnership, and these guys were the enemy to me, is the video game industry. Now it's still early, we're still kind of feeling each other out. Um, but I am convinced that they may unlock the key to re-engaging young people who don't give a damn about school. Uh, and they have taught me that creating a video game has substantial educational value. From the use of science and technology, to the use of graphic design, to the use of interdisciplinary teams, to the use of rapid cycle dynamic learning right away, not waiting for the SAT score to come back, um, or for the midterm, and so, um, I, 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 the thing is about, about your social entrepreneur, so you, you, I, man, I'm way older than you, and I know this much about social entrepreneurship. I just think we need to, I think we need, it needs to be integrated into our system of education. And, and I don't know how that should happen. There are some models going on right now. Silicon Valley, California should be leading the country. The MacArthur Foundation has a, has, I don't know if it's a major initiative, has a, a good size initiative about gaining technology and education to, to inspire particularly young men who just checked out. So there's a lot of work to do on that front, and, and God bless you. Last question. Yes, so I'm studying in the Master of Public Health program here, and we often look at problems that oftentimes have the negative consequences in one field, but they kind of start off in another. 
And in your example, we look at incarceration, and we can see the signs early in third grade reading. I guess my question is like moving forward as someone who's about to enter the workforce, and how do we go about either like on a broad level or like an individual level, start <coughs> connecting and kind of holding some responsibility to some of the industries and kind of seeing like how can we really start putting things together and saying like how can we start looking at education for example yeah. in regards to incarceration and start really saying that this is something that we need to talk about and create this real bond. Yeah, so let, let me give you my, my here's my canned uh, two minute uh, lecture about career choice which is, which is you know, a big part of your question because the, the problem is in public health, you're kind of signing on to a model that's already outdated, right? Which is, and I love public health. Um, here, here's what I would say to you as, um, are you in your 20s? Okay, 20 something year old. Um, I, would, I would take, you know what a Venn diagram is? Okay. <laughs> so you take one circle and you, and you fill it with your passion. You take another circle and you fill it with your gift. What are you really good at? Right. What, what, I think the Lord has blessed us each with a gift. Right? But it's just different. And then the third is the market. Which is, you know, what does the world need? And so an entrepreneur is just someone who thinks about an idea at any time, right, in a given market. And so what you need to do is, you need to, I, I would advise you to spend a little time conjuring up and constructing the perfect job. What would it look like? Right? What, would, what, would it have, what would it be about? What would, you, what, would, what would get you out of bed in the morning racing to get to work every day? Now, that job is probably not going to show up. <laughs> but you got to have it. you got to have it. Be because as you start sifting through opportunities that are out there, you need something to compare those to. And the problem is, particularly in public health, the choices and options are terribly limited for an incredibly important uh, profession. And so uh, when, when you go through that, you'll begin, you begin seeing some traditional pathways, like working with a public health department, um, some less than traditional pathways, and then some really entrepreneurial things that you can you know, push on. And so it, this, this, is a, you know, this is a dinner conversation. I'm giving you the, you know, the, the cliff notes version um, in, in about 90 seconds. But, but I would, I would you know, the, the one thing I would say when we talk about this at dinner, the beauty of your generation is you said to our generation, we got new rules. <laughs> right? This 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 thing, this thing that you can take investment dollars and have social return as well as, as equity return. This idea of of, of technology as a, as a platform to fuel and support tactically you know, social movements. Um, but social movements with, with a purpose, right? So, so the, uh, what was the, the, the movement that was the 99%? Yeah. Occupy. 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 Phenomenal tactics. What was the strategy? What, what was all that about? And so, and I don't mean to sound harsh and critical. I, I, you know, those tactics of mobilizing and engaging them were wonderful. And then, what? And, and I, so, I think, I think your generation, don't be handcuffed by my generation's choices for your career. Thank you. Dr. Ross, on behalf of my colleagues in the School of Management, Kathleen, Catherine Horiuchi, Jennifer Walski, Richard Waters, Ron Harris, Michael O'Neill, on behalf of our Dean and all of us joining here today uh, for this, and thank you for a marvelous capstone lecture to our Change the World from Here series at the University of San Francisco.
Thank you, man, for President for Biden, Jennifer Turpin, and Mike Weber. It's great to have you here. Thank you.